Hello, my name is John Burkhalter, and it is my distinct pleasure to bring you along to join with me in exploring the nuances and intricacies of profound harmony and invention, music of the Baroque. Passion, drama, rhetoric, gesture, these are some of the qualities that are common to Baroque art and to its music. There are some essential characteristics of almost all Baroque music that are always evident, including the expression of emotions, the alignment or orientation of melody and bass line, whether vocal or instrumental, and the ubiquity of dancing rhythms. Baroque music tends to be stirred or expressed in affections. Baroque composers sought to express passion or affect. In the case of vocal music, it is usually the emotion expressed by the words being sung. For instrumental music, the listener, you, the Princeton Festival audience, receives the emotional message embedded in the music as interpreted by the musicians. The Baroque period encompasses a huge range of changing musical styles in composition and performance practice and range of audiences for whom the music was originally designed. This talk is just a mere glimpse into the mix, the distinctive character and genres of the various Baroque works you will hear at this year's Princeton Festival, covering an extended period of nearly seven score years. It is important for me to reference the sources for some of my ideas for this presentation, and I wish to express my profound thanks to Bartold Kalkin, professor of Baroque flute and performance at the Conservatories of Brussels and The Hague for his insightful book, The Notation is Not the Music, and special gratitude to Professor Wendy Heller, chair of the Princeton University Department of Music and author of Music in the Baroque. I had the great opportunity to be of assistance to Wendy for the aforementioned. I am grateful to my friend and colleague, independent scholar Nicholas Locke, a Handel and Vivaldi authority for his kind assistance. So what does Baroque really mean? Taken from the Portuguese who coined the word barroco to describe a flawed pearl. The French version commonly adapted, Baroque, continued throughout the 18th century to imply bizarre or grotesque. Philosophe Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote in his Dictionnaire de Musique of 1768, a Baroque music is that in which the harmony is confused, charges with modulation and dissonances. The melody is harsh and little natural, the intonation difficult, and the movement constrained. It has only been at the outset of the last century that the term would become the lingua franca of art and architectural historians and begin to take on its implications of bold, decorative, confident, and flamboyant. As the great critic and esthete Sir Kenneth Clark, later Lord Clark, wrote of the age of the Baroque, the Baroque style relied on grandeur, exuberant detail, movement, content, and surprise to evoke a sense of awe. It was meant to appeal to the emotions balanced with its concern with geometry, perspective, and references to classical themes. In terms of performance practice of Baroque music, we have continually evolved over the span of the last decades. For instance, when I started playing early period copies of Renaissance and Baroque recorders, as well as Shalm and Baroque oboe, understanding the principles of performance was emerging from the archive and was an ongoing revelation. My teacher, Franz Bruggen, along with the harpsichordist Gustav Leonhardt, were pioneers in the field, as were the Baroque oboist Michel Piguet, with whom I coached. And the three Kalkin brothers, Vilant, Viola de Gamba, Sigiswald, Baroque violin, and Barthold, recorder and Baroque flute. Barthold, as we've already learned, is the author of the influential book already referred to, published by Indiana University Press. And Indiana's Jacob School of Music is the locus of a very strong program in the United States for early music study with an emphasis on Baroque performance practice. As Kalkin relates, in his beginning explorations, he could not understand how Baroque music, as it was frequently played before the early music revival, could be so mechanical, straightforward, unemotional, even simplistic, compared with Baroque paintings, statues, literature even, or architecture. Over the years, he has pondered which role Baroque music played in different layers of society and how its features would vary according to its function. Another consideration and examination of the position of the performer between the composer and the audience, the consumer, varying according to the nature of the piece to be performed. His book, in effect, could be the subtitle of our investigations. 
The most important notational parameters of early music are all woven parts of one integral artistic experience. In Baroque music, aspects of formal notated inter interpretation are sometimes lacking, especially in Italianate compositions, not because the repertory was played without expression, but because composers, regardless of national identity, steer mostly left it up to the performer. As the great 18th century German flute virtuoso and composer Johann Joachim Quantz wrote, the good effect of a piece of music depends almost as much upon the performer as upon the composer himself. Quantz, like other writers of didactic treatises, likened music to formal speech, the connection with the principles of rhetoric. Another prime consideration in Baroque performance is the rhetorical power of music and its fundamental linkage to the art of oratory. To communicate strong passions and persuasive emotions, Musical rhetoric was a way of arousing, expressing specific passions, fear, love, hatred, anger, joy, in short, highlighting and signaling the affects of a work, employing all the elements of music, scales, rhythm, harmonic structure, tonality, instrumental color, were to be interpreted effectively, whether the music be vocal or instrumental. Obvious examples, an upward leap, an exclamation, a rising scale to indicate a question, or a falling chromatic scale to denoting sadness. Major and minor keys of music were often associated with mood or effect. For example, from Marc Antoine Charpentier's 1682 Regles de Composition, or Rules of Composition, we learn that various keys are associated with various passions. And as you can see, C major, gay and warlike, or F major, furious and quick tempered subjects or B-flat major, magnificent and joyful. In earlier times, there was no standard pitch. Paris and Rome, a very low pitch, A392. North Italy, actually higher, around 440 and higher. In the German city's courts, especially Dresden, A415. While hearing a piece lower or higher might not make a difference, the mood and sound color will be undoubtedly changed. A minuet, A section, played on a recorder at A440. The same A section played on a different Baroque recorder at A415. and an even lower recorder at A392, Paris pitch. And back again to A440. Recorders and flutes essentially are the pitch pipes and are good guides to regional variation in Europe. Since pitch, as we now know, was variable, many woodwind makers would make different middle joints to make it possible to perform repertory in different locales. In the case of traversy, Baroque flutes, some makers made as many as seven middle joints or multiple joints. And here we see a flute actually made by Quant, circa 1750, in the Musical Instrument Museum in Berlin. And notice the, the sections of the flute box to accommodate the various middle joints for his flute. Pitch rose steadily throughout the 18th century. It's only a worldwide agreement signed in 1953 that declared A above middle C on the piano should be forever tuned to 440 hertz thus becoming the standard reference for tuning all musical instruments based on the chromatic scale most often used in the West. There were variable tuning systems for mean tone linked to Pythagoras, oriented around major thirds that favored specific keys and associated rhetorical character. To well-tempered, a term meant that the 12 notes to an octave were tuned in such a way that it was possible to play music in all major and minor keys without sounding perceptively out of tune, a form of, shall we say, nearly equal temperament. Think of Johann Sebastian Bach's well-tempered clavier. Before the metronome in the 19th century, there are few precise descriptions of tempo. 
Some theoretical writers, treatises, describe tempo by means of a pendulum. Quantz, is in his important flute tutor published in Berlin in 1752, expressed his guide to tempo in simple proportions of an average human heartbeat. While absolute tempo can be elusive, the proportion of time can be indicated by time signature and by the character of the tempo that might be indicated, such as, for instance, in French music, lentement, gaiement, or in Italian music, adagio or vivace. Considerations of tempo were also aligned to architectural space with varying acoustics. Baroque music is steeped in rhythmic vitality. A very important consideration in approaching the performance of Baroque music is the role rhythm plays in the interpretation of the two main national styles, Italian and French. One of the features of French music is the appropriate application of notes inégal, or unequal notes, characterized as long, short, and good taste le bon goût consisted in not only knowing how unequal one had to sing or play. The basic difference between the performance of French and Italian music was that French musicians altered rhythms in performance to a greater extent than Italian musicians. Francois Couperin, seen here, wrote in L'Art de Toucher le Clavecin of 1716, we write music differently from the way we play it, which causes foreigners to play our music less well than we play theirs. By contrast, Italians write their music in true note values in which they intended them to be performed, for example, we dot groups of quavers, that is, eighth notes, moving by step despite the fact that we write them equal. Our custom has enslaved us, and we continue with it. Ornamentation was an essential element of the Baroque aesthetic, be it visual, architectural, musical, etc. In music, it provided the performer with an opportunity to demonstrate his or her good taste, technical skill, and powers of invention. The art of ornamentation is precisely that, an art, whether passaggi or florid embellishment in Italian music or les agremens or graces in French repertory. The best known examples of florid ornamentation are the astonishingly embellished versions of the slow adagio movements of Arcangelo Corelli's celebrated Opus 5 violin sonatas that go far and beyond simple trills as published by the esteemed firm of Roger in Amsterdam in 1710 with the claim that they were composed by Corelli as he plays them. So you can see the second line is the original version of Corelli's adagio and the line above it is the florid ornamentation. So you can see the extraordinary uh, range and breadth of the passaggi that uh, Corelli is, is reputed to have played in the execution of his violin sonatas. French composers, on the other hand, from the latter 17th century through the early decades of the 18th century, usually took great care to indicate agrément accurately and often provided tables which show how they are to be interpreted. A superb example of this can be seen in Francois Couperin's Pièce de Clavecin, Premier Livre of 1713. And you can see on this chart um, the various um, applications of ornamentation that Francois Couperin expected uh, players of his music to incorporate in their performances. As seen in this chart, this unique style of performance was designed to demonstrate performer's finesse in a manner analogous to the graceful movements of a dancer. The agremens were obligatory and intrinsic to the music and not to be ignored, just as it was improper to forget court etiquette. As to the applications of ornaments in the Princeton Festival performances, you will hear much that is spontaneous with careful consideration of harmony and musical structure. You will not hear ornamentation driven for the sake of ornamentation, for again we learn from the great teacher Quantz. It is true that ornaments are absolutely necessary for good execution, but they must be used sparingly or they become too much of a good thing. The rarest and most tasteful delicacies produce nausea if overindulged. The same is true of musical embellishments. If we use them too profusely, hence it is apparent that embellishments may improve a piece where it is necessary and mar it if used inappropriately. Among the features common and consistent throughout the Baroque period is the presence of the notational system called basso continuo, a sort of musical shorthand. The Dario Castello composition is among the earliest dated works in the Princeton Festival programs and one of the first to employ the principles of basso continuo. 
Composers provided a single bass line with numbers added above or below the staff, either music and manuscript or printed editions. For the instruments of the basso continuo group, that is chordal instruments, either harpsichord, organ, lute, theorbo, chitarone, actually one and the same, a long-necked bass lute, or harp, these instrumentalists read the figures indicating what harmonies are required and accordingly realize the required harmony. How they are applied with additional decorative progressions are the performer's responsibility. And here we have a marvelous painting of a continuo group, harpsichord, cello, and lute. The formula was salubrious for knowledgeable players who were sufficiently fluent in the style to interpret the figures. As we contemplate hearing the Princeton Festival Baroque concerts in this distracted age of pandemic, it is important to reflect on the perils of virulent pestilence that affected Europe during the Baroque period when all the composers represented lived. Daniel Defoe, seen here, was already a prolific and well-known author by the time he wrote a journal of the plague year at the age of 62. He had had careers as a merchant, a spy, a political journalist, a religious and social satirist, a poet, a travel writer, an economist, an author of conduct books, and a novelist. Born in London about the year 1660, his parents were dissenters from the Anglican Church and the Act of Uniformity. So Defoe's early years were not only including persecution and religious intolerance, but he was five when the plague swept the city in 1665 followed the next year by the Great Fire, which destroyed four-fifths of the medieval center of London in three days. The rest of his life would be characterized by the remarkable twisting, turnings, leadings, and bounding of fortune. He wrote his plague year with a fictional character charting a journey through a city transformed, the streets and alleyways deserted, the horrifying stories of the citizens he encounters as fear, isolation, and hysteria take hold a book both fascinating as a historical document and a work of masterful imaginative reconstruction, also a cautionary tale for readers in 1722, for the book was in fact Defoe's response to the aftermath of a horrific outbreak in 1720, as you see in this painting, of the bubonic plague in the seaport city of Marseille that broke out with renewed viciousness at a time when the plague had more or less disappeared in Europe in the decades following the 1665 pandemic. Defoe would have known a book published in London in 1721, Richard Bradley's The Plague at Marseille Considered with Remarks Upon the Plague in General, showing its cause and nature of infection with necessary precautions to prevent the spreading of that direful distemper. The course of the Marseille plague was charted in the broadsheet newspapers of the day. This is exactly the same period when Mr. Handel is employed in London, 1720, by the Duke of Chandos. Johann Sebastian Bach is Hofkapellmeister to Prince Leopold of Anhalt Kerten between 1717 and 1723. Vivaldi, the Red Priest, is active in Venice. All regions and cities that could easily have been swept up in pandemic chaos, save for the mitigation of the disease in Marseille. The history of the revival of music for our purposes, Baroque instruments, essentially begins in the early 20th century and gains momentum in the years after World War II. The goal to make modern replicas of instruments seen in the visual arts and based on surviving original instruments in both private and public collections. These collections are significant in myriad fashion, providing instrument makers with models to copy, preserving an important cultural heritage, preserving the evidence of exceptional artisanship, and fundamentally preserving an important part of historical social fabric. Throughout the Baroque period, and especially in the 18th century, there were extraordinary professional players, player composers, whose works were originally heard in churches, princely courts, purpose-built concert rooms, and will be heard in both Princeton festivals. There was also the role of music played in the home, especially among amateur music makers. Here, Hogarth's Matthias family, a place where politeness and taste could be displayed. Music making throughout the Baroque period could be thought of as a collaborative endeavor, bringing groups of people together to perform and listen, and as such was thought to contribute to and illustrate social harmony. Music publishers were keen to provide play-at-home editions of theater and opera airs and other instrumental repertory. 
From the beginning of the 17th century through the mid-18th century and beyond, there was an ever-increasing interest in knowledge about instruments and instrument construction. There was a much respected and close affinity, mutually beneficial, between the skilled performers and inspired builders to make changes in construction that allowed musicians extraordinary possibilities of enhanced dynamics, timbre, to play with greater ease and facility. These instruments were produced in often family-run ateliers or businesses. You will hear the violin in various permutations, an instrument that had its primary locus in North Italy, Cremona most specifically, the home to the Amati Guarneri and Stradivari families. Here you see this, the Gould Stradivari in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in its original Baroque state. Some of the instruments played by members of the Princeton Festival Baroque Ensemble are modern, modern copies, replicas from the studios of these great masters. Others are antique instruments that have been, as it were, re-baroqued. Concerning the characteristics of period violins, the most obvious are a shorter neck, no chin rest, gut strings, sheep, not cat, more, much shorter bows. France was the main center for the construction and refinement of woodwind instruments. The bore of recorders, transverse flutes, oboes, and bassoons were fundamentally changed from cylindrical to conical. Such a new bore allowed for greater range in color and accordingly exploited to aesthetic ends by composers and performers alike, occasionally one in the same. One of the unfortunate aspects of concert life during this period of pandemic is the dearth of performances of Baroque music, including wind instruments, and alas, none will be heard at this year's festival, Baroque Concerts. The birth of the Baroque is also a time when pipe organs and the harpsichord reach new levels of refinement and sophistication. Harpsichords from the celebrated firm of Rutgers were always prized well into the 18th century when there was a healthy market in adaptation and even fake Rutgers instruments decades after the atelier closed. In fact, almost no Rutgers harpsichords survive in a structural or musical condition since manufacture. The Rutgers studio was along with the studio of Rubens among the glories of early to mid 17th century Antwerp. This harpsichord by Johannes Rookers was made in 1612 and in large Revelement and acquired its black lacquered exterior and vermilion lid interior in England during the first half of the 18th century. Reputed to have once been owned by Handel, the harpsichord is now owned by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and on loan to Fenton House, a National Trust property in London. The Princeton Festival Baroque concerts conceived by Juan Carlos Zamudio with the players led by the Baroque violinist Chiara Fasani Stauffer under the overarching title Sacro e Profano, or Sacred and Secular, feature an extraordinary range of composers, several still too underappreciated. One master is Giovanni Battista Vitali. With the pr musical presence of Giovanni Battali, we are introduced to one of the principal Italian composers of chamber music for strings in the period before Arcangelo Corelli. This Bolognese violin master was also a virtuoso cellist, was in the employ at the court in Ferrara of the music-loving Duke Francesco II d'Este. At the d'Este court, he composed a range of music for all occasions, including cantatas, oratorios, and various instrumental works, including the Opus II Trio Sonatas of 1674. From this set, you will hear the sonata in D major. The, son the sonata set, prominently due to its pronounced popularity, with a lack of extreme technical demands, especially among connoisseurs, was rep reprinted no less than five times during the course of several decades. As a compositional form, the trio sonata is a work written in three parts, two upper parts and one bass. The bass, but not always in the Baroque proper or historically, was supported with a chordal instrument, principally harpsichord or organ. So in essence, a trio sonata could have four players. Cast in the sonata de chiesa, church form, that is in four movements, slow, fast, slow, fast, as contrasted with the de camera or chamber sonatas that are rooted in dance forms, this sonata's short movements could have been played between or even during several parts of the mass liturgy to substitute for the motet that could occur after the epistle or to be played during the gradual, the offertory, or at the elevation of the host, communion. Possibly used as well for the entry and exit procession of the priest celebrating and acolytes. 
Sonatas of this sort were popular for domestic use. Many grand houses of the nobility in Ferrara, and you can see some examples in the slide before you, and elsewhere had private chapels and musicians in the household. While Solomon Majestic, a character due to its liturgical associations, this trio sonata is brilliantly crafted. In addition, a notable feature of Vitali's Opus II sonatas is the running or walking bass line and chromatic themes foreshadowing Corelli's own Opus I trio sonatas of 1681. Again, under the arches of Sacro e Profano theme, it is fitting that the first of the many trio sonatas on the two festival Baroque programs is followed immediately thereafter with a celebratory flourish, a highly energized toccata by the great keyboard virtuoso Guillermo Frescobaldi. Toccata means literally to touch, was a musical form much revered by numerous masters of the Baroque. Think of Johann Sebastian Bach's famous Toccata in D minor, BWV 565. Da da da, da 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 dum, bum. With careful consideration of the notation of a Toccata as a guide, the performance of such a work should be improvisatory in character as well. With sudden and magnificent bursts of energy and exuberance, and in this fantastic style, Frescobaldi was an acknowledged master of the form. He received his earliest musical training in Ferrara at the music-loving ducal court of Alfonso II d'Este. His renown as a performer and teacher brought him eventually to Rome, where he enjoyed unparalleled success and approbation, not only from equally music-loving cardinals, but from the Pope himself. Pope Urban VIII appointed Girolamo Frescobaldi in 1608 as organist of the Basilica of St. Peter's, at a time when the basilica was beginning to be newly transformed architecturally by the superlative master architect and sculptor Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who had entered the Fabrica, or the Vatican Construction Project. Except for the period when he was court organist at Florence in the late 1620s, early 1630s, Frescobaldi remained at St. Peter's until his death. Frescobaldi's fame rests on his instrumental works. Very little information concerning the life of the Venetian composer Dario Costello. Extant title pages to his works provide the only firm evidence of his existence. They also indicate that he was the leader of a group of wind instruments, Pifri, hence the name of the Philadelphia-based ensemble Pifro. Costello published two collections of sonatas made up of 29 works scored for up to four instruments in basso continuo. In Venice, as a musician, at St. Marco, he would have had direct contact with Claudio Monteverdi, who was Maestro di Capella there. As Wendy Heller has written, pyrotechnics, rhythmic contrast, and sudden changes in effect were equally effective in compositions for strings and wind instruments, in which the instruments accompanied by basso continuo could surpass singers in terms of range and speed. The Venetian wind, cornetto, and violin virtuoso Costello was among the early instrumentalists to advocate a modern style to an instrumental form or an idiom. The work you will hear, Sonata Prima in A minor, from his Concerted Sonatas in Modern Style, Book Two of 1629, encompasses a broad range of affects and techniques requiring considerable virtuosity. He even calls for special effects, such as tremolo, which could be created with breath or tongue via wind instruments, cornetto, or bow on a violin. The sonata in a stream of contrasting moods or affects is a bravura tour de force, intricate, nuanced with piquant harmonies and invention. With Costello, we witness the profound harmony and in invention that characterizes the birth of the solo sonata in Italy that reaches its full flower Hortus Musicus and refined and bespoke Opus 5, 12 Violin Sonatas, 1700 of Corelli. It is thought Dario Costello passed from mortal life during the 1630-31 plague that ravaged Venice. Historical demographic sources, even though uncertain, suggest that over 43,000 died out of a population of approximately 140,000. Johann Kaspar Kurl, organist, harpsichordist, and leading master of the Middle Baroque generation of South German Catholic composers. Following early music studies in Vienna, Kurl was sent by the Archduke of Austria, Ferdinand III, then Holy Roman Emperor, in 1645 to study in Rome with the prominent composers Giacomo Carissimi and Gerlamo Frescobaldi. 
His study in Italy had great influence on his composition, much of which is thereafter Italianate in style. At mid-century, Curl was the court opera comp conductor in Munich, where several of his operas were produced. Thence to Vienna, again where he became organist of the imperial court, before returning to Munich in 1692, having relinquished his Vienna position to live out his remaining days. The Curl Trio that you, you will hear is essentially a seamless succession of virtuosic display between the violins that trade off exceedingly fantastic figurations and further displays of extraordinary chromaticism and special over-the-top features, including ravishingly complex tremulo effects. Again, a remarkable tour de force. The two great late Baroque era composers, Bach and Handel, both studied Curl's music. Bach arranged part of Curl's Misa Superba in his Sanctus, BWV 241, and Handel frequently quoted themes of Curl in such works as Messiah and Israel and Egypt. The Pifa, or Pastoral Symphony, from Handel's Messiah, a musically rhetorical bridge between the chorus, for unto us a child is born, and the recit, there were shepherds abiding in the field, draws upon the tradition stretching back to at least the closing decades of the 17th century of representing the nativity of Jesus by writing tranquil, melodious pieces that could, be, that could conceivably suggest a nighttime scene of pastoral repose as the shepherds of the nativity kept watch over their flocks with drone basses imitating the Zampogna or Italian bagpipes that Handel may well have heard during his time in Rome or other rustic instruments or as a sort of lullaby for the newborn child. However, this particular pastoral symphony is one of those that unlike, for example, the pastoral that closes the famous Christmas concerto of Corelli, incorporates the jig-like dotted rhythms and melodic gestures of the Siciliana. In so doing, Handel seen here with a messiah on the console table, aligns this piece with one of the two common expressive trends in Sicilianas, especially one that is used to represent pleasure, contentment, and appropriately here, peace and tranquility. Pietro Antonio Locatelli, born in Bergamo, Italy, might be called the first of the great traveling Baroque violin virtuosi. As a youth, and his prodigious talent was recognized, and he was accordingly able to travel to Rome. There has been speculation that he perhaps studied with Corelli, but for certain he was in Corelli's orbit. Following his Roman sojourn, he had traveled north to Italy and the German territories, pursuing performance opportunities before eventually settling in Amsterdam in 1729, a major center of European publishing, where he lived for the rest of his life, leading a group of amateur musicians and teaching. Though his playing was highly praised, some observers found it too brilliant. Likewise, the originality of his works was admired. As a composer, he focused on the sonata and concerto, achieving a fusion of sorts between the Roman style of Corelli and the Venetian style of Albinoni and Vivaldi. His extraordinary caprice for solo violin ad libitum, L'Arte di Villino, Amsterdam, 1733, with special effects, a veritable repertoire of bowing acrobatics, presaged by a century technique on the edge of what the later virtuoso Paganini perceived or thought was solely original to him. Locatelli in Amsterdam, like Handel in London, had an extensive art collection in his house on the Prinzengracht, or Prince's Canal, along with a library featuring books on history, philosophy, literature, and science, in addition to music, testify to his breadth of knowledge. You will hear the trio sonata opus five, number five in D minor, subtitled Pastoral, published in 1736. The opening largo and subsequent vivace are again marvels of intense chromaticism with the presence yet again of amazing tremulo effects. The concluding pastoral evokes the bucolic setting of shepherds, the sunlit Italian campagna or countryside, and an idolized relationship to nature. The color of the instrumentation suggests the rustic, hand-cranked mechanical string instrument hurdy-gurdy, or in Italian, the gironda. An almost direct contemporary of Johann Kaspar Kerl, Heinrich Bieber, an Austro-Bohemian composer, was in his own lifetime considered an outstanding violin virtuoso. Although unlike Kerl, he is not known to have toured as a performer. He wrote instrumental music or vocal music, sacred or secular, with equal ease, and he spent most of his life at the court of the Archbishop of Salzburg. 
His creativity was nurtured in the ecclesiastical city and as a supremely original composer, eventually was ennobled in 1690 by the Austro-Hungarian Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I, himself an accomplished composer and dancer. Bieber is best known for his compositions for the violin, in particular those involving scordatura. Scordatura, which literally means mistuning, refers to the practice of using an alternative to the violin's normal tuning in fifths, allowing the player to produce different sonorities and timbres, as well as impossible double or triple stops, that is two or three note chords. While not the only composer to employ the technique, Bieber used it to great effect throughout his career, most notably in the Rosencrantz, Rosary or Mystery Sonatas, a set of multi-movement works for violin and continuo collected in an elaborate manuscript of circa 1678, comprising 15 sonatas and a concluding pasakaya on events or mysteries experienced in the life of Christ and the Virgin Mary. The actual mysteries are grouped, as with spoken prayers of the rosary, into three sets of five, plus the concluding pasakaya. The sonatas encompass the breadth and scale over two hours in duration that can be seen to be equal that of a passion. Each sonata is accompanied by a tipped-in engraving that links it to one of the 15 mysteries of the rosary associated with the Virgin Mary. To achieve maximum effect and heighten the music's distinctive character, Bieber proscribed a different tuning scheme for each sonata indicated by the notes just to the left of the clef at the beginning of the piece. As Wendy Heller has stated, the style, form, and affect of the sonatas lends the set a deep sense of spirituality and mysticism. We hear at the Princeton Festival the 14th sonata in the set entitled Assumption of Mary into Heaven in six movements comprising an opening sonata followed by movements grave, adagio, two arias, and a concluding dance form, a jig. As you will hear, Bieber's violin technique was far more advanced than his Italian composer contemporaries such as Giovanni Battista Vitali in the use of fingering and bowing, excelling in counterpoint, frequently writing fully polyphonic textures with the use of multiple stops as already referenced. Astonishingly, the mystery sonatas remained unpublished during Bieber's lifetime. Of noble birth, Isabella Leonarda, later an Ursuline nun who spent her entire adult life in a convent, the Collegio di San Orsolo in Novara, a city to the west of Milan. Though never known as a performer per se, Leonarda composed litanies, psalm settings, vespers, responses, and four masses. No doubt convent life stimulated her musical creativity. As for medieval times, convents were havens where talented women could express their talents freely. A very prolific composer, Leonardo published nearly 200 compositions during her long life. Most of these are sacred vocal works, but in 1693 she published her sonata a uno, due, tre, quattro strumenti, a collection comprising 12 sonatas, 11 for two violins, violone and continuo, and one solo sonata for violin and continuo. These are the first such sonatas published by a woman and only in recent years have these sonatas comprising the complete instrumental works of Leonardo appeared in a modern printed edition. We are therefore very fortunate to hear Sonata Prima in E minor, which is a work of ecstatic, almost mystic beauty, radiating sheer joy and transcendence. Leonardo's musical gifts were certainly infused with the spiritual and transformative vision, the light of the Virgin Mary, Queen of Heaven. From the second set of concerts in the Princeton Festival Baroque series, Sacro e Profano, this great image of Johann Sebastian Bach painted in Leipzig, 1748, by Elias Gottlob Halsemann, was once owned by musicologist, bibliophile, and philanthropist William H. Scheide, and hung in a reception music room in his house on Library Place here in Princeton. Gifted by Bill, the painting is one of the glories of the Bach archive in Leipzig, an institution for the documentation and research of the life and work of Johann Sebastian Bach. With the unification of Germany, Bill wanted the picture to go back to Leipzig, and as Judy Scheide recounts Bill saying, this is the way it should be. As the opening of the second Princeton Festival Baroque concert, we will appropriately hear a prelude taken from the cello suite in D minor, BWV 1008. The six cello suites for unaccompanied cello by Sebastian Bach 
are some of the most frequently performed and recognizable solo compositions ever written for the instrument. Bach most likely composed them during the period 1717-1723 when he served as Hofkapellmeister in Curtin. The title given on the cover of Anna Magdalena Bach, his second wife's manuscript, announces Suites of Violoncello Solo Senza Basso, or Suites for Solo Cello Without the Bass. As usual in Baroque musical suite, after the prelude which begins each suite, all the other movements are based around Baroque dance types, allemand, courant, sarabande, minuet, bourre, gavotte, and usually a concluding or final jig. The Bach cello suites are considered to be among the most profound of all classical music works. Due to the work's technical demands, etude-like nature and difficulty in interpretation because of the non-annotated nature of the surviving copies, the cello suites were little known and rarely publicly performed until they were revived and recorded by Pablo Casals in the early 20th century. They have since been performed and recorded by many renowned cellists and have been transcribed for numerous other instruments, including recorder by Franz Bruggen. They are considered some of Bach's greatest musical achievements. It is fitting to record the thoughts of the great Baroque cellist of recent memory, Honor Bielsma. Should one, as a rare exception, add something here? Add notes to in a text where the composer in general is so clearly using as few as possible? Three notes establish a gut-wrenching sadness for Bach composes in response to the death of his first wife, Maria Barbara. The prelude consists of two parts, the first of which has a strong recurring theme that is immediately introduced in the beginning. The second part of the scale-based cadenza movement that lends to the final powerful broken or arpeggiated chord. Bieber makes a second appearance here in sonatas from Harmonia Artificioso Ariasso really do offer artful vocal harmonies, as the title promises. In each sonata, Bieber proscribes with the mystery sonatas different, sometimes considerably different, returning again the application of scorda tora that results in a range of string tension more or less depending on the tuning, which leads to a completely new tonal differentiation. Astonishing Oral Delight, Harmonia of 1696, his last known published collection of instrumental music, includes seven partitas or suites. The partita number one in D minor from Harmonia is exceptionally vibrant and dynamic in intensity and lush musical color, especially as it opens, with a sonata in slow, fast, slow tempi and moves forward to include such stylized dance forms as allemande or German dance, to an animated leaping jig with multiple and complex variations, an elegiac aria of profound beauty and pathos followed by the exotic sarabanda with associated variations, concluding with a presto, a final flourish. James Oswald's variation sonatas are of a basic air jig type. However, in his curious collection of Scott's tunes circa 1739, it contains a novel sonata of Scott's tunes. In this work, Oswald introduces a different Scott's tune in each of the five sections. Oh, dear mother, Ettrick Banks, she rose and let me in, Cromlet's lilt and poureth on the green. The tune she rose and let me in was among the most popular and esteemed melodies, and as Scottish musicologist David Johnson comments, the entire sonata is nicely turned, a potpourri of popular melodies in a form of composition that was unique to Oswald. Here is the opening of She Rose and Let Me In, one of the hit tunes of the age. James Oswald was also a music publisher, active in Edinburgh before 1740. The following year, he moved to London and set up his own publishing company, specializing in printing popular music, his most celebrated being the Caledonian Pocket Companion in 15 volumes, collection of Scots folk tunes and his own variations, some of extraordinary complexity, employing Italianate violin playing techniques. A feature of many of the melodies is the Scotch snap rhythm of short, long, in other words, ta-da, ta-da. His renown was such that in 1761, 
He was appointed as chamber composer to George III immediately after the king's accession to the throne. With their boldness of invention, their expressive range and extraordinary variety of three-part texture, Handel's six Opus II sonatas have been said to represent the ultimate peak of the trio sonata as a genre. The six trio sonatas of Handel, seen here in a painting by Baltasar Denner, are not a homogenous set. The works first published around 1730, but stylistically seem to date from circa 1718, and that one, actually number two, the earliest in the set, was possibly composed in 1699, and survives in a copy that was once owned by Charles Jennings, the librettist of Messiah, which is annotated, composed at the age of 14. One of the other fascinations of these sonatas is the amount of material shared with other works of Mr. Handel, his own filching of his own quarry of his repertory. Some later reused, for example, in the trio in B flat major, HWV 388, that you will hear, Handel reused the final movement in an organ concerto. By the by, a manuscript exists of this very sonata copied by none other than Johann Quantz. With the Piccinini Toccata in G minor, the Thuriorbo Chitarone, again one in the same, moves from its role in the continuo group, shining now as a soloist in its own right. Note the lute-like body with an exceptionally long fretted neck. This allows for a more rich and sonorous bass. The frets aid, help the performer in placement or pressing of the fingers on the fingerboard instrument, thus producing higher or lower pitches. Alessandro Piccinini is the third composer in the Princeton Festival concerts to be linked over time to the Deste Chord in Ferrara. He later entered the service of Cardinal Pietro Altro Brandini in Rome, who was also a patron of Tarquato Tasso and Girolamo Frescobaldi. Piccinini published two volumes, In Tavolatura di Liuto e di Ticcarone in 1623 and In Tavolatura di Liuto nelle quali di Contagnano Toccata in 1639. Both collections feature a range of dance forms from Balletti, Correnti to Gagliardi. In the preface to the earlier volume, he claims to have invented a type of arc lute, now thought to be a bass lute, and praises the virtues of the chitarone. The prefaces to both publications also contain interesting performance practice instructions, as is the case with the Frescobaldi keyboard toccata, that of Piccinini for a different plucked instrument is a model of the virtuosic, emphasizing the dexterity of the player's fingers. The Princeton Festival concerts close with a dazzling work by Antonio Vivaldi. The Venetian Vivaldi was a virtuoso violinist and Roman Catholic priest. His distinctive reddish hair would later earn him the subriquet Le Prieto Rosso, or the Red Priest. He was appointed violin master, composer, and led rehearsals of music at the Ospedale de Pietà, a charitable home for foundlings. This is a remarkable drawing in the Cora Museum in Venice of the building as it looks circa 1715. Today, the Metropole Hotel occupies the part of the Ospedale that contained the music room. The Pietà specialized in the musical training of female wards and those with musical aptitude were assigned to either its esteemed choir or orchestra, much traced by local Venetians and visitors to La Serenissima or the most serene republic. During the course of his career, Vivaldi also worked in Mantua in the employ of Prince Philip of Hesse-Darmstadt, that city's governor. His published editions were circulating in the German princely courts, including Dresden, and here a magnificent view of Dresden painted by Bernardo Balotto, whose uncle was the famous Antonio Canaletto. Dresden, with its celebrated court orchestra led by Johann Piesendel, Quantz was a member of this orchestra. Piesendel was further acquainted with Vivaldi personally, having visited him in Venice as part of a tour of Europe. It is likely another German, Johann Sebastian Bach, when a court musician in Weimar heard about Vivaldi via the famed Dresden Orchestra. He would come to arrange for solo organ a number of Vivaldi's Opus III string concertos from the set called L'Estro Armonico, or Poetic Inspiration. Bach's transcription of the Vivaldi concerto in A minor, BWV 593, is perhaps the most revered by organist. Vivaldi was one of several composers we've learned who derived inspiration from Corelli's masterful creative process. 
a comparison of Vivaldi's single movement folio trio sonata in D minor published in 1705 with the older master's Opus 5 12th sonata for violin and continuo that is also a single movement folia reveals many similarities, especially in the choice of virtuosic figurations for violin solo. Vivaldi takes advantage of the extra violin to engage in felicitous imitative play. Vivaldi's trio sonata is a series of variations on the famous folia or Follies of Spain theme set by myriad composers, Corelli, as we've already mentioned, as well as Mara Marais and Francesco Maria Geminiani, to name but a few more. Generally called La Folia, the Italian translates both as folly and madness, and refers to the frenzied way peasants twirl to the melody. And so we see freeze frame, a frenzied twirler. This is a stylized work that has a long history rooted in Iberia, both Portugal and Spain then spread during the 17th century across the Mediterranean. The melody took off in Italy, perhaps in part because Spain then ruled the Kingdom of Naples as a vice royalty before 1713, making cultural exchange between the two countries easier. Vivaldi's trio reflects many aspects of his style that would bring him notoriety, but it is also quite unique within his oeuvre. The sonata may be one of the first, if not the very first, surviving set of variations by Vivaldi a form that he turned to approximately two dozen or so times, and of which six examples were published in his lifetime. It is, however, one of his longest variation sets, and the only set he wrote for the trio sonata medium, his only single movement trio sonata, and his only self-standing variation set. Whether or not Vivaldi was influenced either directly or through intermediary works by Corelli's folio violin sonata, in this sonata, he took pains to demonstrate an original voice, increasing the virtuosic flair of all the parts and his gift for expressive melodic writing. On this latter point, it is worth observing that Vivaldi included a lyrical variation inspired by the Siciliana, perhaps the first time this character type had been used with the folius theme. Oh, and by the way, another composer intersection with the Princeton Festival concerts, both Bach in a cantata, BWV 212, or the Peasant Cantata, and Handel in a harpsichord work, the Sarabande from the Suite in D minor, HWV 437, quote the folia melody. One of the many felicities of the Princeton Festival Baroque concerts is that betwixt and between the well-known names of Bach, Handel, and Vivaldi, this year other repertories are considered from the quills of Leonardo, Curl, and Vitali, for instance, composers well admired and respected in their respective lifetimes, but who have awaited rediscovery now for your enjoyment. Baroque music has been, as Thomas Forrest Kelly, professor of music at Harvard writes, the keystone of the modern early music revival, led by a distinguished group of early music players, pioneers, men, some mentioned already at the outset, but also by extraordinary women alike, such as the Baroque violinist Alice Harnoncourt, Marie Leonhardt, Lucy Van Dale, and Monica Huggett, amongst others, in a dazzling constellation, who from the early 60s and beyond began to create a new sonic world of Baroque music. Monica Huggett is one of the foundation teachers for the renowned Juilliard School A415 program in early music performance. Chiara Fasani Stauffer and her players are all laureates of the Juilliard program, are heirs, they are musical descendants of the pioneers and have achieved a level of expertise that makes their performances, as you will surely hear, authoritative and inspiring. Salute Chiara! <laughs> 